Good morning. Thank you so much for granting us this interview. Uh, we uh, would like for you to state your name and your profession. Uh, my name is Stephen Denny, and I work here at the Library of UC Berkeley. I catalog books from Vietnam and other countries. Wonderful. Uh, how long ago have you been doing this? Well, I've worked um, for the university since 1983, and um, for 14 years I worked at what's called the Indochina Archive with Douglas Pipe. And that was a um, different kind of work, and, and it did involve research in Vietnam, among other things. And then after the archive closed, I came here to the library where I work uh, to catalog books. Wonderful. I believe that you co-authoring with uh, Jeanetta Sagan uh, of the book called Violation of Human Rights in the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, April 30th, 1975, April 30th, 1973. 1983. Yeah, 1983, I'm sorry. The report for the Aurora Foundation, five photo in documentary condition of re-education camp. Can you uh, give us some information about this? Show the book up here. Um, yes, so... Um, it's going to be higher, Stephen. So I'll keep holding, uh, sorry. Right there. Yeah, this is the report I co-authored with Janetta, and um, I should mention that it was updated in 1990 and expanded upon and that involves many other people besides myself, uh, published by the Aurora Foundation. And your question again was... Um, that, that's good. Uh, okay. I'm going to have my next question. Should I keep this up? Uh, you can put it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, Mr. Denning, uh, how did you conduct your research for the report and how did you find the drawing of the condition in the camps? method of torture and position of which prisoner would tie up? Um, our research was kind of divided and my research was much more library focused and much of the research I did was going through uh, documents from Vietnam itself like uh, say outlining their official policy and so forth as well as um, other literature like you know books written by former prisoners and reports and so forth and um, <coughs> The value, particularly, of going through the um, official materials is it kind of proved, to some degree, the extent of, you know, the minimum extent of repression in Vietnam because they set out openly what their policy was, like the different classes of people who were rounded up and put into re-education camps and so forth. I did interview a few prisoners, but most of the interviews were conducted by Jeanetta Sagan and um, with the help of some Vietnamese um, um, so as, as I mentioned, when Van Khan um, arranged for some of these interviews and so forth. And the drawings, um, um, I was not involved in you know, finding the drawings and maps and so forth, but um, some of them I think were reproduced from other sources like early articles from Paris Match, but most of them were drawings um, based on information from former prisoners. In that part, um, Jeanette was working with other people about. Uh. Exactly how many interviews did Janetta conduct for this report? How many did you conduct and where the interview conducted? Who did uh, she interview? Who did you interview? I think you can answer generally. Sure. Yeah. I interviewed only two or three people myself. Um, Janetta interviewed hundreds of former prisoners. I don't know exactly how many. I know at least 200 at the time the report came out. I think it might have been closer to 400, I don't know, um, and she even said 900 once, huh? but I, I don't know how many. I do know that the interviews were for the most part conducted at her home, and um, she had a kind of set questionnaire that was based on the kind of questionnaire Amnesty International would have when they would interview former prisoners, um, as, uh, because Janetta herself was a high-ranking person within Amnesty International as a volunteer. Um. What interviews stand out in your mind and why? Well, um, for me, um, as I mentioned, because I interviewed so few people, um, I, I guess I'd have to mention, you know, just talking with friends who have been in the camps, and one of the things that stood out in mind was being in prison in Konex boxes, these um, air freight containers that seemed to be a fairly common form of um, mistreatment for the, um, the education camp prisoners. Did they describe in detail how they were, why they were put in that connect and how, and uh, you know, what affected them from that punishment? I can't recall because it's so long ago, but um, 
I think sometimes it's practically like, not, no offense at all, but just kind of coming into the camps, they would put some people into the clinic spots for a few days. Uh, describe what you and Janina found and learn why, why you're compiling this report. So, uh, describe what you and Janina found and learn why you're compiling this report. Well, Janina often said to me that in the interviews there was a depressing quality of similarity to the accounts. That means many of the prisoners had very similar experiences that was depressing. <laughs> and from my point of view, it was also depressing just going through all the official propaganda. I did it for three months, just everything I could find for three, a period of 75 to 78. And after a while, that becomes depressing too. I can imagine if you're Vietnamese and you're living there, how depressing it is just to read Yanzan or whatever, or listen to it on the speakers. But what we found, um, with regards to re-education camps in particular, is that it was systematically aimed at um, just rounding up anybody who might possibly represent a threat to the regime, not based on anything they actually did, but because of the association with the former government of South Vietnam. That, for the most part, but also included writers and artists who may not have been associated with the government and even dissidents. Um, excuse me. But um, it was... Um, a system where you know they were told to report for re-education and they were officially given the impression it might be a few weeks to a month but many were still in the camps 10 or 15 years later um, so it was of course based on deception to some degree just to get them into the camps and um, there was no real ethics involved in how the prisoners were treated it was more based on what the purpose of the government was you know the Kind of the ends justifies the means, and the end was to uh, maintain uh, complete communist control over the South. So, uh, when you found in the government newspaper and material, did they explain anything about why they kept the prisoner and what they can do with them? Any trial or any sentence that they give to them in that nature? Um, well, first of all, the official rationale that was provided by the government of Vietnam to Amnesty International, in a book that Amnesty International actually published, the correspondence between the organization and the government, was that by law, all the people that they put in re-education camps in South Vietnam were guilty of treason because they had supported the opposing side. And so by law, they, they could justi be justified to execute them or to put them in jail for 20 years to life, you know, under the criminal code. Of course, this was with North Vietnam. But because they were merciful, instead they would put them in the re-education camps where they could be rehabilitated, so to speak. That was the official rationale. Um, of course, it was very cynical. And the prisoners themselves, um, one of the conditions for their release or you know, good behavior was to write confessions of what, everything they did, and not only that, but to then announce others so that the government could track down other people, partly. And um, so um, there was no system of real justice involved in, the, in, in how they were imprisoning these people. Um, it officially, it was an alternative to um, you know, punishing them by bringing them to, to trial and so forth. but. Um, no, no re-education camp prisoners I can recall were actually brought to trial. That was later used against uh, dissidents, which was different, like the Buddhist monks who were um, arrested in prison in 1977. Uh, so, um, how many political prisoners were there at the time you report at the peak, and what, what were the condition of the camp and the prisoner treatment? At the time the report came out in 1983, I would have to look at the report, I think, um, because of that estimate I, I would not really know myself. And it would be hard, of course, in any case to estimate it, but I think Jenna might have been even estimated something like 60,000 or 100,000, I really can't recall the number. Um, I think at that time the official 
from Vietnam, the official estimate might have been like 20,000 or something, or 10 to 20,000 prisoners. And once I attended a talk given by somebody who was sympathetic to the Vietnamese government, it was actually here at UC Berkeley, his name was Don Luce, and, and when he said, you know, according to Vietnam, there's like 10 or 20,000 prisoners, the, the Vietnamese mostly who were in the audience just laughed at him because they you know, knew that was just propaganda. But how many were actually in jail? I mean, the re-education camps, you know, would be difficult to estimate. You'd have to you know, look at how many were imprisoned in a particular camp and then extrapolate from there and, and so on. And of course, it would change, but um, I think, it, as it turned out, um, there were actually many more prisoners detained in the camps than had been previously believed. Um, the official estimate given by Pham Van Dong um, as to how many people went through the re-education process, and he said one million people, which included people who were, you know, re-educated, so to speak, by going to classes and coming back home. Um, but um, generally speaking, people would estimate a couple hundred thousand were actually put into the camps um, for more than, um, let's say, for more than a few years. But how many exactly, I wouldn't know. If you could take a snapshot of typical relocation detention center, what would it look like? Would that change as you went further north, further south, if so how? I couldn't really answer that question, honestly. I, I know that um, the camps in the north are probably harsher, and, and that's where the higher ranking officer was, was sent, but I couldn't describe, you know, at least not from memory, um, what the camps would look like. Uh, truthfully, the former prisoners probably could, but I couldn't. Uh, was there a difference in the treatment of political prisoners based on their background, whether they were affiliated with the religious organization, unemployment, unemployee of the former government of the Republic of Vietnam, a former military officer, a journalist, a teacher, a police officer, a student, a magician, if so, how? Um, it would be hard for me to say what the differences were. Um, I think it had more to do with um, how long you were detained. And, and um, some prisoners, particularly like, for example, um, Tran Van Twin, a former um, uh, leader of the South Vietnam legislature and opponent of two, were treated very harshly. And he, was, uh, he actually died in prison because he talked back to the authorities. And um, so there were cases of you know, individuals who were considered obstinate, who were tortured and so forth, um, and who may have been singled out, but in general I think um, the um, harshest behavior was reserved either for the highest officials or for dissidents, um, or particularly for people who did not cooperate with the re-education process. The location of re-education re camp drawn and put together. I, I was not involved with that, but I believe uh, Dr. Nguyen Van Khan um, was the primary person and his nephew Nguyen no, no Trung, who helped Janetta um, uh, compose a map of the re-education camps. How did you come up with the picture of the prisoner with tie up and who drew this picture? Um, <coughs> A few pictures I'd seen published before, but most of the drawings had come from uh, prisoners. And again, this would be, um, I mean, former prisoners, and this would be a process I was personally not involved with, but when I'd gone and I think worked with Jenna in, in getting that together. Uh, so tell me about the pre May 1975 the re education camp in the North. If what, uh, any, are uh, the differences between pre May 1975 and post war of re education camps? I know relatively little about that, but you know, the most um, descriptive accounts of what life was like in, in the northern re education camps came from Nguyen Chi Tian, the poet. And of course, his descriptions were extremely uh, grim of life in, in the northern camps. And, and Nguyen Chi Tian himself was a uh, dissident who was in prison since 1960. Um, <clears throat> there were perhaps some former, um, I mean, there were perhaps some 
uh, military people who were detained in the re-education camps um, in, in northern Vietnam, I mean from the south, but I think um, to a large extent it was used for uh, any, you know, one who's kind of considered a dissident in particular. And of course there are also, it be interesting to compare the prisoner of war camps and how the American uh, soldiers were treated. Um, and um, it's well known that many of the American POWs in northern Vietnam were, were tortured. And that might be some evidence of torture, similar forms of torture that were practiced on the Vietnamese. Uh, one thing uh, we found out that uh, people like Nguyen Chi Tien, he was a writer from the north and he was arrested and put in prison. And later on, he, I don't know, I should you, you united with the uh, prisoner from the south. Yeah, in northern, uh, in the uh, irrigation camp in northern of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Do you recall any of those uh, through your study? Or you talk to people, you know? I mainly just recall it from what I read of what Nguyen Tri Tien wrote himself. But um, I, um, I don't know very much about the um, movement of the southern prisoners to the north and their integration with northern prisoners who are already there. I mean, there is an issue, of course, of sending political prisoners into areas with common cr criminals, people who were actually, you know, thieves and murderers and so forth, and how they would be um, treated, but I can't give very much information on that topic. How did the co-authoring this report and conducting research on the re-education camp change and set your perception of aftermath of Vietnam War? It did not really necessarily change my perception because I have been following the issue since 1975 and this report came out in 83. But it kind of deepened my perception that, um, as I mentioned to you, uh, what one Vietnamese friend of mine said under the two government there was not enough freedom, but after the communists took over there was no freedom. And the re-education camps was part of the systematic process to completely control the population of the South. And, um, and, you know, through, for example, making them write confessions, denouncing other people, attending classes, putting them on a starvation diet, and so on. But what struck me particularly is the strong spirit of the prisoners themselves, because I, I don't think there are many prisoners who were actually re-educated as the communists wanted them to be, but it actually kind of worked in reverse. They became more anti-communist, I believe. Um, as a result of the process. So even now, like, if there are demonstrations, like if some dignitary comes from Vietnam, and there are demonstrations, very likely the leaders might be former prisoners. Um, so the re-education did not work for, from the communist perspective. Uh, so how had this act to you given you insight into the heritage of Vietnamese American Vietnamese refugee and ODP, I think you already answered part of it for this question that uh, I'm talking about um, the uh, the co-authoring of this report that uh, how it has aided you and given you insight into the heritage of Vietnamese American Vietnamese refugee or ODP people. Well. Um I think one of the basic points is that, especially for the people who came out of Vietnam for the first 10 years, and many of them came out by boat and many people lost their lives, there's no question in my mind that these people were genuine refugees, I mean, political refugees who were fleeing oppression. I mention that because it's strange, it might seem there was actually some debate, you know, should we consider these people actual refugees or are they economic migrants? And today that's more of an issue people come out of Vietnam today would have a harder time finding political asylum in the United States. But particularly at that time when um, the communists were trying to completely overturn the South, um, in my mind there's no question that anybody who fled Vietnam was a genuine refugee who should be given asylum in the United States. That would be one point. So what do you think about the fact that there are some people out there saying that Vietnamese political prisoner is just a myth. I have not heard that myself, actually, have you? I have. Oh, yeah. Um, from Vietnamese or from, from Americans? From Americans. Yeah. 
Well, um, and from the government of, mm -hmm. um, of Vietnam, communist government of Vietnam. Yeah, well, I think, um, yeah, they claim, for example, that there's no political prisoners in Vietnam today, that anyone who's in prison is in jail because they broke the law. But they don't mention that the laws that are written clearly forbid dissent. You know, like they have laws in the criminal code, like crimes against national security, which are so vaguely written that anybody who criticizes the government could, could be put in jail. And of course, we all know of these well-known cases of dissidents who are in jail in Vietnam now, and they're obviously political prisoners. And in the case of the re-education camps, the whole process was set up so that um, um, it was completely political and there was no justice, and it was based on their political association in the past. And it, these people were political prisoners, and not only that, um, these people were in prison in violation of the Paris Agreements. You know, and during the last years of the Vietnam War, um, there was much discussion about how the South Vietnam government supposedly violated Article 11 of the Paris Agreements, which promised various civil liberties and prohibited all acts of discrimination uh, or reprisal for siding with one side or the other during the war. And this was completely destroyed after the communists took over. They, they did exactly the opposite. They, they ended all civil liberties and they imprison anybody who has sided with the other side during the war. So they were violating the Paris Agreements, which was international law. Yet at the same time, they were insisting that the United States should adhere to the Paris Agreements by giving Vietnam billions of dollars of aid, because that was another part of the treaty. So they wanted to have some part of the treaties enforced, but the other parts that applied to them, they did not want to have enforced. Instead, they established a totalitarian police state. That's what they tried to do. Um, so it's nonsense to say that um, there were no political prisoners in Vietnam, and um, you know, but, but anybody who who's, who knows any anything about that should understand that fact. Even the communists probably know that, but they would simply have to follow the official party line. Yes, uh, the, you know, during those years, uh, uh, the Vietnamese community, Vietnamese American community, tried to, um, you know, um, lobby for the, uh, to the political prisoner release, and uh, the government, um, uh, Vietnam government, saying that there are no political prisoner. Mm -hmm. you know, they just some people broke the law and put them in jail. Right. Yeah, they come up repeatedly saying that, and then of course with the information, some of people over here believe that. Yeah. So that uh, still people suddenly said, well, not really happen like that. You know, it's mm -hmm. just uh, um, somebody broke the law, they be punished, and then and that's what it uh, is was. So but what do you want to tell yeah. them, uh, people like that? What do you want to tell them? Well, they should read what laws they broke. <laughs> I mean, the laws they broke were laws that prohibit dissent. And if the government has laws that prohibit dissent, and say, like, for example, if you um, undermine the national unity of the people, or if you, um, I can't remember exactly how the, the laws were, um, you do anything that criticizes the socialist government, you know, you can be in prison for 20 years and so on. Um, that's a law that they're supposedly violating, which is obviously law prohibiting dissent, and then not only that, when they're brought to trial, there's no justice in the trial itself, it's just a show trial, you know, the, the, for the people who are brought to trial. Now that's different from the people who are in re-education camps, they didn't even have a trial, they were just sent directly into these uh, re prison camps, basically, you know, with no trial or, or any kind, uh, no, like, even like a medical doctor, for example, who was in the army, he would be considered um, having committed a crime because he was helping to heal people who were fighting against the kind of side, you know, or a religious chaplain, you know, um, or even like a reserve officer, you know, who wasn't even actively involved, you know, they just had a huge dragnet of people that they put into the re-education camps in 75. So we understand that Ms. Sagan also involved in the monitoring human rights in South Vietnam during the war. Mm -hmm. Do you have any information about this matter and uh, please share with us? I only know basically what you just said, that, you know, I was, I did not know Jeanette at that time. Um, 
but I do know she was a um, top person at Amnesty International as a volunteer. She and Joan Baez basically got Amnesty International started on the West Coast. And I remember it, you know, back then reading their newspaper of Amnesty International, which they were describing their activities. But um, the difference is that after the war ended, um, Janetta and Joan Baez, they began hearing some reports about human rights violations under the communist regime. And unlike some of their colleagues, they felt they should say something. And the first protest um, against um, human rights in Vietnam actually came from um, someone who uh, knew Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk. And he was a good friend of his, and Thich Nhat Hanh's Vietnamese Buddhist peace delegation um, had been receiving news from the, their, the leaders of the Buddhist church about repression against them. And that's how the first protest um, from the anti-war movement um, came out. It was published as, as an open letter in the New York Times. What year was this? Uh, December 1976. And Joan Baez signed that letter at the time. And um, there was much debate within the anti-war movement of what was left of it. I should say there wasn't much left in the anti-war movement, but on the left there was much debate you know, about, you know, is the government really, um, <clears throat> should we really condemn the government for violating human rights? Maybe now, some people would go to visit Vietnam, even some church people, I read about it, and they, they um, were given like a red carpet treatment, you know, shown the re-education camps, and you know, these people were kind of almost like posing for them, and they would come back and say, oh, these camps are so, you know, they're pretty nice, and so on. Um, very naive, they don't, my former boss, Douglas Pike, would say willfully ignorant. That means they they're just had blinders on. Uh, but Jeanette Sagan was different, you know, she, she was starting to get reports with Joan Baez. And, um, <clears throat> and then in 1979, uh, Duan Van Toy um, had come out and he had started, you know, he was, became the main source for Joan Baez at first. Um, he was the one to contact her and, and she, I guess maybe 78, and, and he was being condemned by some people on the left um, because of his reports of, you know, brutal mistreatment of prisoners. And Jenna Sagan at that time um, um, was interviewing people, like former prisoners like in Paris, you know, because she's fluent in French and she's living there a little bit. And so they, with that information, they came back and they circulated a second open letter that was published in the New York Times in May of 1979. And that was the one that kind of made John Baez you know, famous um, for um, protesting the, the uh, repression under the communist government. And, and at that time, <clears throat> I had started up my own newsletter on human rights in Vietnam, and I mailed copies to Janetta Sagan, among other people, and that's how I came to know her. She contacted me, and, and then I, I began about 1980, I started working with her to um, what, what eventually came out with the report. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, there's some uh, figure in uh, South Vietnam that uh, work very closely with anti-war or Amnesty International over here in the United States talking about the violation of uh, human rights in South Vietnam. Uh, for instance, Mr. Ngo Ba Thang. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, but uh, we also discussed, and uh, earlier you were talking about Ngo Ba Thang when she came to the U.S. in 1990 to try to talk about uh, asking investors who to Vietnam to invest. Um, and then she had a different view about human rights. Can you elaborate that? Well, I, I went to a conference in New York City once, um, a big conference in Vietnam, was sponsored by somebody who was kind of on the left wing side, but he had you know, all these scholars and stuff. And, and so I took the opportunity to ask these Vietnamese officials, what about human rights and so on? And so I saw Noah Tan there sitting you know, at a table. So I came out to introduce myself. And, so oh, what is your interest in Vietnam? I said, oh, human rights. She said, well, human rights is passé in Vietnam. And I, I, I told that to some of my friends over there who were also interested in human rights, and they just laughed, you know, and you have to laugh at that. But it's sad, too, because she was um, <clears throat> somebody who was, um, during the last years of the war, she was, like, very loud protesting repression under two and so on. But then after the war ended, she became like a symbol of how the third force was cooperating with the uh, new communist government. The communist government was being nice to the third force people and so on because she was supposedly third force. But actually she was, to me, she was more like a, a propaganda symbol. Mm 
but there were other people who were genuinely anti-war critics of two, but but who um, were not pro, really pro-communist. I mean, Father Chan Tin is one such example. He was sympathetic to the NLF during the war, but and, but after the war ended, he became more and more disillusioned with the communists. And um, I think around 1978, he began to speak out strongly. Um, and um, you know, he's he, he's continued for many years. I'm not sure if he passed away, if he's still alive, but. You know, he's a leading, uh, became a leading critic of the regime. And then um, there was also the Buddhist monks, the Unified Buddhist Church of Vietnam. Also, we also call them An Quang, Pagoda you know, Buddhists, who during the war, they were very involved in protesting and so on. Um, but after the war ended, the communist government went directly after them. And I think it's because they considered them a possible independent threat to the government. So the very top leaders of the Buddhist Church were all arrested. But... Um, I personally um, came to know um, Sister Chan Kong or Khao Nak Fung, as she was known at the time, who was Thich Nhat Hanh's assistant. And, and she was filtering news out to the anti-war movement about repression in Vietnam under the new government based on what she was receiving from not only Buddhist monks, but from writers and artists and so on. And so um, <coughs> she was influential with some people within the anti-war movement, but she was a genuine I mean, these people are, there are genuine dissidents in Vietnam, third force. And, and also a friend of mine who was, I don't know if you call him third force, but he was in the opposition bloc in the South Vietnam legislature. And I became, he became my closest Vietnamese friend. Um, but, you know, he was very anti communist too. What's his name? Tran Van Tung. Yeah, Tran Van Tung. Tran Van Tung, T H U N G. He, he came out by vote with Nguyen Kong Hoan and Tran Van Shun in 1977. And they held a press conference um, in Japan after they were rescued, in which they denounced the government for its violation of human rights. And they were hoping um, that the U.S. government would kind of come to the rescue. Maybe they, they were hoping maybe uh, go back to Vietnam, but of course it didn't happen. But that was partly why they fled in the first place. They wanted to bring the world's attention to what was going on in Vietnam. And, um, and after, about almost a year later, I came to know him because he moved to Portland, and then I worked with him. Um, on human rights. Okay. Oh, we were close with Miss Sagan now she passed away so it uh, cannot we I we cannot interview her. But uh, she really the champion for human rights. That's why mm -hmm. wherever human rights got violated she uh, come and protest and condemn. Mm -hmm. um, could you uh, share with us the her Taught her feeling, uh, did he, she have a difficult time when uh, she mentioned anything about, well, like you said, that South Vietnam is not in a freedom, but North Vietnam is no freedom in that nature. Is she uh, expressed anything in regarding to, uh, well, somehow we have the no freedom side going over the not in a freedom side and these things happen. Do you remember anything like that? Well, Jan was a, a belief very strongly in the universality of human rights. Um, and um, she herself had been involved in the Italian resistance movement during World War II, and she was captured and tortured by the Nazis. And, um, and um, even the name of the early Amnesty International publication, Matchbox, was based on something that, you know, she had had a matchbox in prison. I can't remember the exact you know, symbol meaning, but. Um, she was, you know, a leading person within Amnesty, and she's still, even though she's passed away, they have a fund and so forth. So she's quite popular within Amnesty International. But during that late 70s, when she wanted Amnesty to become more vocal against what was going on in Vietnam, in the early 80s too, I should mention, there was some controversy among those people who were on the board of directors within Amnesty International. Um, and some did not want to move forward on that. And, and she told me that one person even called her a Cold War fascist, which is absurd, you know, I mean, she, she was anti-fascist in World War II, but a Cold War fascist being a derogatory term because she wanted Amnesty to, to protest strong, more strongly what was going on in Vietnam. But there was that kind of, an, what's called anti-anti-communism. It's a phrase, you know, that sometimes used uh, by some people on the left, that you should not be so anti-communist. You know? But how, how, if you don't like communism, why would you not be anti-communist, of course? You know, it doesn't mean you're, uh, fanatic, but to be anti-communist means you don't support the communist political system. Yes, so 
Um, you uh, have some friend also work close to what we call third, um, third party or third uh, element in Vietnam. Did they express anything um, uh, to uh, regarding their feeling? And they thought about you know after the war, uh, the communists no longer use them or appreciate them. Mm, do you recall? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned to you there is a popular Vietnamese phrase. I don't know the exact words in Vietnamese, of course, but it is squeeze the juice from the lemon and then throw away the peel. And the communists used, um, to some degree, especially in last year, they used the opponents of the South Vietnam government um, for their purposes. And then once they took over, the third force was no longer of use. So they just um, threw them away. In some cases, they put them in jail. And a few um, co-op uh, they could use, like um, you, you might recall if, um, if you were in Vietnam after 75, there was a newspaper called Tin Sang, Tin Chang, by No Kong Duk. Tin Sang. Yeah, and that was a dissident newspaper during the war. Um, yeah. Sounds good. You can continue. Uh, that was a dissident paper during the war, um, but um, after the war ended for a few years, it continued um, under communist auspices. But it was basically just a mouthpiece for the communist government after '75, until they they closed down the newspaper completely. I think it was in 1979 or '80, and um, you know, and and so they had some little elements of what's so-called third force, but they, eventually they just all got completely closed down. And of course now with with um, the South, I mean the Vietnam today is a little bit more open. It's not it's totalitarian. They can't tolerate any kind of political um, pluralist organizations, any kind of like even like a fake democratic party or socialist party that they once had in North Vietnam, they can't allow that anymore. Are you talking about breweries? Can you explain a little bit about that? Is it have anything to do with Vietnam? A pluralism? Yes. Yes, um, by pluralism I mean to have more than one political party. Oh. And um, <clears throat> of course, um, after the Communists took over, there was no political pluralism at all. Um, now, today, many of the dissidents who are spending the most time in jail is particular, precisely over this issue to have political pluralism, to have more than just the Communist Party. Um, you know, and, and today there is, a, I would say today in Vietnam, there is more individual freedom than there was like during the first 10 years after they took over the South. But still, they can't allow, the Communist Party does not want to allow any kind of independent political force because then they feared they would, the whole political system would collapse. So, um, to a um, norm American, Vietnam War is very complicated. Many of them don't understand, and many of them, because it's so complicated, they <coughs> don't want to understand at all. But in a, um, if one phase, uh, you can describe uh, what happened in the two Vietnam War? Why it ended the way it ended? Can you say something about that? Well, I think eventually, from the American perspective, the war ended just because um, you know, um, America, Vietnam was a country thousands of miles away, and um, America just to kind of run out of gas, you might say, in terms of you know, how much aid to give to Vietnam, to South Vietnam. But the anti-war movement certainly helped um, the speed up the process, which is unfortunate because um, you know to oppose the war is one thing. There's many bad things about you know war in general, and certainly in Vietnam we had like Agent Orange, we had bombing, and civilians were killed, and so on, which happens in war. Um, and how many people were killed in Vietnam was was a price worth it? You know, I'm not Vietnamese. So I, maybe I cannot say exactly, but of course after the war ended, the war just continued in a different form, you know, against the, you know, the people in South Vietnam. So for the people in Vietnam, there was no relief after the war ended. But um, it just became worse. And so if I were Vietnamese, I would probably certainly regret the fact that America stopped providing aid to the South. And of course, it was even worse in Cambodia when the Khmer Rouge took over. <coughs> Let's see what else I can, because I mm. cannot come back in, because I need to.
That's yes, yes. Um. Oh, I want to ask you about the uh, anti-war force um, that uh, you uh, got uh, contact with uh, during you do the report. And uh, some of them were very regret about what they done during the war. Can you uh, name a uh, few and then uh, uh, you know, anything that you can share with us? Hmm. Um, it's hard for me to say offhand. I mean, among Vietnamese, there are people like Duan Van Toy who. No, no, no. Um, in an uh, American anti Vietnam War. I mean, like John, John Bates and uh, people that. I believe that uh, Sagan mm -hmm. mentioned about her letter, her cover letter, uh, that uh, Joan Bates, yes, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. Bates um, you have been in contact with them or learned anything about that nature? I believe she sent a letter and she apologized for that, is it? Well, the thing that people may not understand clearly, um, Joan Bias, for example, is a pacifist. So she opposed the war on pacifist principles. Uh, Joan, uh, Jeanette Sagan was a human rights activist, and she wasn't really an, an anti-war activist, but she was working on the human rights issue. Um, now, the division that was within the anti-war movement, as you see, the anti-war movement was united on one, one particular issue, to get the United States out of Vietnam. But within the anti-war movement, there was not unity on how to address the other side. Like Thich Nhat Hanh was an anti-war activist in a way, you know, but he was not embraced by those who thought the National Liberation Front was the sole, as the phrase was, the sole legitimate representative of the South Vietnamese people. You know, that was the war movement between those who um, maybe were pacifist or human rights activists, like Joan Baez or Jim Sagan. Their views did not change, and on the other hand, um, people who thought that the Viet Cong were the liberators. Now among those who were in this other group and who defended the communists after the war ended, some eventually changed their views. Um, just as like in South Vietnam, you know, there were people in the National Liberation Front, like Trung Nguyen Tong, for example, who embraced the communist cause at first, but then they were kind of, even the National Liberation Front people were kind of set aside. And the people, um, there were some people I think today, who maybe back then might have defended the communist government, who, who today would not defend it um, for repression. And within that group, you know, peop not, not, I'm not talking about hardline communists, I'm talking about maybe religious people, like the kind of people I mentioned to you who visit a re-education camp and say, oh, this looks very nice, you know, because they were, those people eventually maybe changed their views. Uh, I did not know them personally, really, not many of them personally, but the people I would identify with more were the people like maybe Joan Baez or Jenna Sagan or maybe um, Khao Nak Phuong, Chik Nhat Hanh's assistant or even like Bo Van I to some degree who were pretty consistent um, <clears throat> in maybe they were anti-war but they did not really change their point of view you know, to, to support human rights or to be pacifist you know, it just they were unrealistic I think in terms of uh, you know how their activism might be used during the war years because it was exploited by the communist side, and eventually, you know, the war ended in the way it did. But I don't know if they necessarily regret what they did per se. I mean, it was they were being consistent with what they believed in. They would draw up and all that awful demonstration and mm -hmm. end up with people got killed. Or can you describe and did you involve in any of those, uh, I mean, uh, demonstration? Um, I did go to a few of the big, huge demonstrations. Um, my political activism actually was just over one school year, 1969-7. It was the only year that I was really doing very much. I marched in a few demonstrations and at my school um, in Santa Barbara, we, you know, they had a, once they had a police riot, so I went to a demonstration to protest police brutality. But um, I was not really a political activist per se. I remember at one point, though, um, it was in 1969 after Ho Chi Minh died, I believe, I read an article in Newsweek about the land reform campaign in North Vietnam and how uh, that there were like 50,000 people died you know, in this campaign. And I remember making photocopies of that article. I put it on different places around campus. But I wasn't, and then I wrote a letter to the editor about that. It wasn't published in the student paper.
but that was kind of the extent of my activism. You know, I wasn't really. But then I, I marched in San Francisco. They had a huge anti-war demonstration. I remember um, going to some of those. It was just the kind of thing that would attract young people because they have all these rock and roll bands and movie celebrities speaking to this demonstration. You know, half a million people might have been there. But it was kind of strange to me because some people were pro Viet Cong, you know, and then some people were um, Maoist and some people were, you know, anti communist maybe, but you no, know, it was all a mixture of different people. But I was never, I never felt comfortable with the people in the anti war movement who were carrying the Viet Cong flags or whatever, you know, I did not feel comfortable with them. And then during the last years of the war, I attended some events that a religious chaplain at my university, from which I just graduated, uh, organized, and they would have these people like, who just come back from Vietnam, they were uh, like American Friend Service Committee people and so forth, and they'd talk about human rights in South Vietnam and so forth, and that's how I kind of got involved in Vietnam, because I noticed how they talked about it, but then the war ended, just, you know, this was a two-year period, then the war ended in 75, and suddenly it became a non-issue for them about human rights. And why, why was it important to talk about it when, when South Vietnam government was there, but then the communists took over and became worse, but they, they didn't really talk about it. And that's why I started becoming active. Five minutes. Okay, five more minutes? Yeah. That's it. That's it. That was you again? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I love that answer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, mm, okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, uh, from your what your I mean uh, research and uh, um, observe, you think that uh, the anti-Vietnam War uh, understand anything about Vietnam War? What was going on there and why the South Vietnamese have to have the war that the North Vietnam invade them in nineteen. Did they understand any of that? Maybe some people did, I, I don't know, because the anti-war movement is kind of a vague term, but um, I think um, for the most part, Americans in general, whether anti-war or pro-war, did not really understand Vietnam very well. Um, personally, I, I think, you know, for me personally, I did not really understand Vietnam very well until I came to know Vietnamese people myself because when you've lived through it, you, 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 you have a much better perspective than if you're just reading about it in newspaper articles and so forth. So I don't know to what extent the anti-war movement itself really understood those issues. So uh, the last <coughs> one is, uh, do you know, want to say anything that we haven't asked you yet, so please share with us if anything at all. Um, well, I, I think, um, you know, I, as, it, as events have changed and developed, Vietnam itself has evolved into something of a different society, but it's still, I think, basically a repressive one-party authoritarian regime. Um, and today, people can do much more research in Vietnam and so forth, um, but nobody's really doing studies per se. I mean, there are groups like Human Rights Watch, but I don't, I don't know if anybody, no academics can go to Vietnam and do research on re-education camps and so forth. Um, and I look forward to the day when maybe Vietnam has enough freedom that even a topic like that um, can be the subject of a serious study by people going to Vietnam itself, as opposed to just interviewing people you know, who fled the country or reading reports. Thank you very much sure. for your contribution, yeah. your time, yeah. and everything. Yes. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.